Pesawe Kanda, also live on 3FM 92.7 on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're streaming live right now. You can also listen to us live on Kesme 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. We're also live on 3news.com all across the world. This evening, the search and rescue efforts underway to free trap miners more than 24 hours after an illegal mining pit collapsed on them killing seven people with three in critical condition. We'll give you updates on that. We have a man, Godwin Asidiba, is at the disaster site as we speak. We'll connect live and bring you updates of what's happening there. Also, the Functional Executive Committee of the NDC holds talks with voter regional executives and representatives of two K2 North parliamentary aspirants over the May 13 parliamentary primaries deadlock. We're live at the NDC headquarters in a bit for the latest on this particular one. Meanwhile, well, there's a youth group demanding that Adam Agbana be declared the winner over John Adanu Zew in Saturday's primaries. We'll give you details of that shortly as we cross over live to the NDC headquarters here in Accra where there's been a crunch meeting ongoing over the last three hours to resolve this matter. Stay with us. We have the latest in business, sports and entertainment coming up over the next 60 minutes here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. <laughs> Let's get into the details now. And the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, says seven persons have died after an illegal mining pit. That's a Galamse pit collapse at Takuma in the Birim North District of the Eastern Region as rescue efforts continue throughout the day. The illegal mining pit caved in while active mining was ongoing with some persons already feared dead. It's unclear what caused the collapse of the pit but some community members suggest the heavy rainfall recorded in most parts of the country on Monday is a contributing factor. My colleague Gordon Asidaba has been interacting with some of the eyewitnesses. He's going to be connecting with us live shortly uh, to give you a quick update of what's happening there right now. What we do know is that three persons are in critical condition while seven have been confirmed dead. Now, an eyewitness, one Franco Wusu Amwa, who said he personally got involved uh, in the rescue efforts, has been speaking uh, to us, giving us details of what happened there and what's what the National Disaster Management Organization has been doing so far. Take a listen. To Mr. T. Ewahanusi, until around 10, 11 morning, I said, until I'm a call by, I said, I said, I'm a Juma, I'm a Flo, Takoso, I'm a Bay Collector community. I'm a Nebu, Tirashi to the Sim, say, Bako, then I'm a Bua, need me, you won't. We will say, see, most of the time, we are here, put me a civil microphone, Tirashi Bayano, not to say, I'm a good or so near Dorso, Tinachi, a man power, I'm soon a day, the shovel near the ye but because of say in full twenty, ni padudua I said the biyan kumu room no, and that's how ni padudua na iti man room. So I say I'm a son of Dina and iti man room. Iti say I kasi I kuni pata iti twenty ni asi for India. Yeah India, ubi ni ubi iti man kasa. Because since we are forced to say because the biya, I'm not able to say ubi iti man ubi aye baki ya to no have. Well, that's an eyewitness uh, there talking to my colleague, Godwin Asidaba, who is alive from the uh, disaster site. What we do know is that seven people, seven of the miners, is this illegal miners, have been confirmed dead um, because of what happened yesterday. Godwin Asidaba is connecting with us live from the area that is specifically uh, the pit at Kole Tei in the Brim North District of the Eastern Region. 
Godwin, thank you so much for, for what you're doing over there. What more do we know about the disaster that happened yesterday? All right, Alfred. It's actually a threat to get to the Takoso illegal mining site, and that is actually the only source of livelihood for most of the youth in the Kualite, um the community. And currently, the NAGMO officials were actually spotted in the premises some minutes ago, and we are still trying to put in frantic efforts to search and rescue some of the illegal miners who are believed to be trapped under the illegal mining pits which caved in um, from the yesterday in around 10, 11 a.m. thereabout. Uh, some of the local miners there who were actually eyewitnesses were able to retrieve 10 bodies. Unfortunately, uh, seven passed, like you rightly indicated, and three are uh, in a critical condition currently receiving treatment in the hospital. That is the actual update here. But in the entire community, uh, most of the residents are saddened. I engaged a lady who actually lost her husband. So, um, they have four kids together. This woman was so sad and giving to an extent that she couldn't even speak to me because she was hearing anything she opened her mouth. So that's how hard this situation has been. And most of the residents here in the forest. I see. Now, uh, you've been interacting with some of the uh, the survivors as well and, and the people in the community. T tell us, what have been telling you about this, this particular mining pit, this area, and, and the fact that, we, from what we gather, this is something that they have been engaged in and it's, it's where they actually feed. It's the source of livelihood for them. So most of the eyewitnesses, I mean, those who were part of the illegal miners who were able to survive, how they tell them is that this is actually a service because most of them are quite new in the job. This isn't the first time such a situation is happening in the community. It happens once in a while, but because it's not rampant, most of these illegal miners turn a blind eye to some of the things that would happen and they go to mine illegally. But because of Monday's rings, which actually, uh, you know, affected that particular community drastically, it actually, um, you know, reduced the strength of the rock. So from a distance, when we are watching into the pit, you can clearly see large, huge visible cracks that you can tell that can easily collapse with a small blow of wind or an easy. But these illegal miners did not, you know, take all that into consideration and they went in there to mine. And that was why it, it actually happened. So most of those who have survived, a young man that I spoke to, whom I will be highlighting later um, on News 360 at 7 p.m., made mention of the fact that he left the capital Accra to come here to, you know, find or make life better for himself to engage in illegal mining. But because of this situation, he was actually still seen in the illegal mining site, washing through the debris to see if he can find some gold particles to sell and come back to the Accra. So that's how hard, um, you know, this situation has actually hit most of the people who work around there. But how many people were rescued alive? Um, uh, three by the, by three of them were rescued alive, but according to the eyewitnesses, some of them are still stuck under the rubble. But the NADMO, you know, officials are yet to actually come in to ascertain the problem because it's actually a walking, like an hour walk distance from the community to the mining site. So you climb up the mountains, which is like an hour walk. It's not an easy trek out there. See, so is there any idea of how many miners were trapped um, as a result of the disaster yesterday? So according to the eyewitnesses, those who were able to survive, they can give me an accurate number, but they told me that there were about 17 people trapped at the debris. But he, they also confirmed to me that they believe that some of their sisters are still under the debris. I see, but uh, the three who were rescued, what's their condition now? Hello, Godwin? Hello, Alfred. Yeah, yes, no, the, the line was a bit cranky, but I was asking the condition of the three who have been rescued. Yes, so like I was indicating, we followed up to people in the community, uh, Roman um, and the um, 
to prove the body is kind of so according to the chief of the hospital the other people in the hospital who are currently in treatment but he told the remaining three who we have been told that are in a critical condition receiving treatment have not been transferred to that hospital so probably have been moved to a different hospital we will be opening up to the their current well, so uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, this update. That's my colleague Godwin Asidaba who is joining us live from the disaster site uh, where we've got information that seven people have been confirmed dead. And of, that's according to the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, said that they've been, there are some persons who have still been trapped under a cave pit at Kolite in the Brim North District of the eastern region yesterday uh, some of them according to not may have escaped through an another alternative route that they created themselves seven of the miners have been confirmed to have died when the illegal mining pit caved in uh, yesterday and uh, we also got information that as close to about 17 people have also uh, been rescued uh, together with three who are in critical condition as confirmed by my colleague Godwin Asini but uh, this is something that we're keeping a close eye on here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. If you look at the number of these incidents that have happened over the last one year at least um, on the 27th of May 2022 three persons were killed a dozen feared were fear trapped in a collapsed mining pit somewhere this was in the central region also on the 14th of july 2022 five people escaped on head from the pit in the old mining town of Pristia. also we had another case on the 27th of may 2022 where an illegal mining pit collapsed and killed three people in denchura breman in the central region and we will give you details of these um and and as a result of these consistent issues that's been happening over the period what has to be done um to ensure that this is addressed quite comprehensively seth walashime is a mining consultant is joining us on the telephone so let me thank you so much for joining us on hot edition so i've just chronicled a number of these incidents similar incidents that's happened over the last 12 months one year and it appears that no concrete measures have been put in place to deal with this what has to be done in your view from the courtesies of the ministry of lands and natural resources and also the minerals commission yeah thank you very much uh alfred and uh good evening to your cherished listeners uh i keep on saying that you know, mining as an activity has been happening in this country for over a century. And by this time, we should have institutions that are, that are capable of managing these issues. They will happen, but it could be minimized. Uh, we have a mines department under the Minerals Commission. Their duty is supposed to make sure that our mining activities are safe and that they don't uh, pose a, a threat and, 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 and uh, to our, life, our lives and uh, what do you call it, the environment. Those, that department must be strengthened with the needed resources, both human and material, to be able to go to sites where mining is taking place look at the operations and advise and say, listen, you can't do this, you can't do this. These are the actions you have to take to avoid A, B, C. It is doable. I keep on saying it. It is doable. The, the, you see, the institutions are there, but they don't have the, 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 the wherewithal to be able to, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, deliver on the mandate that the law has given them. So why even put those uh, 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 institutions in place in the first place? If they are not going to be allowed to do their work, if they are not going to be resourced to do their work. So that is the problem. And instead of, uh, we, we have this ad hoc approach to, to managing our issues, we, which is becoming a kind of canker in this country. We must stop it. 
see you talk about the ad hoc approach and, and i'm asking so if institutions have to be called upon to do what you're suggesting which institutions are those and what specifically has to be done finally we need the minerals commission the mines department under the minerals commission to be resourced in terms of a human resource and also the logistics to be able to there must be a kind of inspector around every mining activity it could be zoned the way they have zoned the country there should be a couple you know a pool of uh, uh, mining engineers that should be available to advise people who are mining you know the, 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 this current one i suspect happened because the rains are, are are here with us there might be some cracks in in those pits there will be seepage of water that will make uh, uh, the soil that is holding the pits uh, uh, at bay to to be weakened and therefore the caving so if 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 you had people who were supposed to be there to be uh, uh, advising they will say listen under this weather condition you know please can we allow this uh, weather to 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 abate a bit before we can we can start going deeply under the ground again you know things has to be done properly for cancer right on Mr. Walashme, thank you so much for your thoughts on this one. And this is something we're keeping a close eye on and definitely we'll be updating our listeners and our viewers on Facebook on with my colleague Gordon Asenik who is live from that disaster site. This is Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. We're also live on Kesme. 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. You can also watch us live on Facebook at 3FM 927 on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We have some breaking news just coming through now. So the news just coming through uh, as we're learning now is that after a crunch meeting of the National Democratic Congress, NDC, uh, that's the candidates for the K2 North constituency. Remember, after the primaries on Saturday, there was a tie between Adam Agbana, that is on one side, and also John Adanuzeu. There was a tie after a recount. Now, there's been a crunch meeting that's been ongoing at the headquarters of the NDC for, for the past three hours. A decision has been taken, and that's the information that we have right now. My colleague, Eric Mauna Egberta, is at the headquarters of the NDC. He's joining us live. Mauna, what's been the decision so far as, after this crunch meeting? Right, so the decision is one and one only that Eric Edemagdana uh, be declared as the victor in the K2 North constituency primary of the opposition NDC. A special committee was formed today, chaired by the national chair of the NDC, Johnson Asiedun Ketia, as well as the general secretary of the party, FIFI Fiavikwete, well represented, where the voter regional. Uh, chair of the NDC, Mauto Agbavito, the regional secretary as well, James Kunu, along with constituency executives and uh, agents and uh, assigns of the two leading candidates as well, they were all fully represented in the meeting just that just ended about 10 to 15 minutes ago. And the conclusion which was drawn from the meeting was that they heard from all respected parties, Ede Magbana, John Adanu, the regional executives, constituency executives, individuals responsible for conducting the primary in the K2 North constituency, and amongst other things, took evidence and subjected same to proof and scrutiny. Evidence to suggest that they asked very poignant and specific questions. These ballot papers, which were later discovered not to have the stamp of the Electoral Commission. How many were they? Now the indication we get is that there were five in total ballot papers that were not stamped, two for Edem Agbana, one for John Adanu, and then two to another candidate. Then the question that followed was that, where did these materials come from? Did they come from the national head office of the National Democratic Congress? The answer was in the affirmative, that 
these were materials that emanated from the national headquarters, which was deployed to the K2 North constituency for the primary there. And so, based on that fact and based on that understanding, the conclusion was drawn that since these ballot papers were not foreign materials, then it presupposes that no wrong was done. The other thing was that there was a tallying of all of the votes, including rejected ballot papers, and it was proven that there was no overvoting. All of the votes tallied with the delegates which were expected to vote in the K2 North constituency. All of the delegates voted. I was there. There was just one person who delayed the voting process. I actually saw that one person. And so when they tallied everything, it all amounted to the number of delegates expected. And so the concern of a potential case of overvoting as well was dealt with. And so the conclusion drawn was that despite the closeness in the race, the true will of the delegate of the Ketu North constituency needs to be respected. And what's the true will of the delegate of Ketu North? That despite the slim margin, Eric de Magbana won, even though it was just by a vote, it was majority that carried the day, and so or first passed the poll, and so a conclusion was drawn that Eric Edemagbana has been declared the victor in that primary, Alfred. Let's take a listen to the General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Kwete, addressing the media who was present, we understand, just a few minutes ago. In fact, just five minutes ago, uh, this press conference uh, ended. Take a listen. Well, clearly, an important, I mean, a figure part of the, 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 the booklet. Uh, we therefore were in a position to say, that we want the voters had expressed in the original counting that happened actually is the authentic expression of the will of the people of Ketuna. Now, so according to that original intention, even though it was such a very, very close contest, we needed to go with the original uh, uh, result. And that original result had candidates Eric Eden Agbana having 360 votes, followed very closely by candidate John Adam, who had 359. Very close as it was, we needed to go with the will of the great people of Ketunov, because that is truly what their will was. And so we wanted to use the opportunity to simply tell you that at the end of the day, the committee, uh, headed by the national chairman, aided by my own self, together with the panel, came to that conclusion, and we have com uh, communicated that to the two parties and to their uh, uh, agenda came with them, to the national, to our regional executives and to the constituency executives, that the will of Ketunov, which is that Eric uh, Abana oh, was the yeah, one that won the most number of votes on the day, even though it was that close, Eden Abana will be declared the candidate, the parliamentary candidate for Ketunov. <laughs> So that's Fifi Kwete there addressing the press just about five minutes ago uh, at the NDC's headquarters of that, that crunch meeting. Now the, the resolution is that Eric Edemagbana has won or will be declared the winner of the primaries in the Kitu North constituency to represent the people of Kitu North on the ticket of the NDC in the 2024 general election. So, Eric, how about the, uh, the John Adanu Zewu? Because I know he was at the meeting uh, as well. What has he been saying or his representatives been saying after this meeting was communicated? Well, um, not too pleasant outcome for him, uh, such he wasn't even a part of the meeting which saw to the announcement of this decision. Um, just after the meeting, I mean, in the flurry of exchanges, greetings and the like, the indication was that there was just going to be a short address. He made his way out of the national headquarters of the NDC and as such, we couldn't get words from him as to concerns, if any with the decision or the conclusion as arrived by by this special committee which was put together but there was word from eric ede mcbana who per the resolution from the meeting uh it was agreed that an apology uh he issues an apology to executives of the ndc in the voter region 
and constituency executives who he may have slighted in the heat of the moment uh, there's been the, the battle of words really in the media space and the life even after there was a call for a ceasefire by regional executives and as, so, as such he also took the opportunity as well to apologize to not just the regional executives but the party in general and reaffirm the pledge and the commitment of himself and all of the people in the Keto North constituency to ensure they secure 85 percent of the votes for the opposition national democratic congress in the next general election okay oh well, let's take a listen to eric Magbana now uh, after that decision was reached well good evening um, to all of you i want to use this opportunity to first thank the special committee of the national executive committee that sat on the matter and to thank them for bringing finality to this issue we also want to say a big thank you to the regional and constituency executives uh, of the NDC who all agreed to be a uh, party to the um, meeting that led to the resolution of this matter. Let me also thank my opponents uh, for especially Mr. John Adam and his team uh, of lawyers also for uh, being a part of the meeting and to say that I want to retract and apologize sincerely for uh, some comments made in the heat of the moment. As we all know, um, when the tensions were high, we granted some interviews and said certain things that we consider unpalatable. And so we apologize for those statements. I want to use this platform to call for unity. The party's interest is key. It is important for all of us to unite to maintain the Keto North seat and as a campaign team, we made a singular promise to the good people of Keto North uh, to get 85% of the votes in the 2024 general elections. Well, so, Mauna, there you have it. That's uh, Eric Adamagbana there uh, doing yeah. exactly what you said, apologizing for his earlier comments. Um, so so that's it. I mean, I see his, his lawyer, Edujita Maklo, as well. So the, the, there were some young people in the constituency as well who uh, were present, correct? And, and what did they have to say? Well, to really make any commentary because the party, the national executives, continue to make the argument that uh, it's, a, it's a conclusion that has been drawn and not everybody will be happy with. There's even been caution uh, for supporters of Eric Edemagbana not to uh, rub it in the faces of the opponent and that they be measured in their celebrations. And so that's largely been right. the position of national executives they didn't take word from anybody just uh, allowing them apologize and then peace can reign so that it can really begin to work towards election, towards election 24. thank you so much eric mawena egbeta is my colleague uh, reporting live from the ndc headquarters where that crunch meeting has ended and the decision after the meeting is that eric edemagbana represents the people of kitu north on the ticket of the ndc going into the 2024 elections as its parliamentary candidate now let's go on to the te other telephone professor runs for jumpo is a professor of political science at the university of ghana Lagon. Professor Jampo, thank you so much for, for connecting with us on hot edition you were with us in studio when this thing was playing out on on saturday now a decision has been reached some sort of compromise after the party looked into it they have decided based on the votes that the will of the people of keto north be upheld that enda magbana represents them how is this going to play out well, um, I I was in your studio, um, TV3, last Saturday, and I called on the party to ensure that um, the voting outcome um, be upheld. Um, because it doesn't make sense to me. Um, you go to polls, um, polling results are counted, and then one person wins by one vote. You order a recount, a recount is done, the person still wins by one vote, then the person leaves the vicinity, leaves the area, 
out of joy, jubilating, and then you go and then you order another recount again when the person is not there, and then you come and tell us that certain things you know, have happened and so um, nobody emerged victorious. I thought it was a cock and book sto uh, uh, bull story. It didn't make sense, and I knew that something had happened when uh, Adam and his team you know, left the vicinity of the area. And that's how come some of us insisted that the party echelons should intervene to ensure that the view and the wishes of the people um, um, get, you know, upheld. And so I'm excited. I'm happy about this. Um, uh, the moment um, Adam Agbana, when he was interviewed, indicated that he contested and, you know, against all odds and that um, the party leadership at the regional level and at the constituency level all schemed against him, I knew that something like this was going to happen because I was saying, I said it on air, that, well, he should have been quite magnanimous uh, in his comments after uh, he being declared, you know, victorious. But, uh, so I said that, and <laughs> it didn't um, get to just even about one hour, and then we heard that this thing had happened. Sometimes um, in electoral contestation, if the margin of victory is that slim, and you you know that people schemed against you and you win, you sound you you, you are required to sound conciliatory and magnanimous in such a way that you would not um, rip up that antagonistic sentiment in them against you. So in my view, I think that they felt that look, um, this guy, if you don't do something right from the one, he's sounding antagonistic and. Um, he would worry us. That's why they did what they did. But I'm happy that some of us called on the party echelons to intervene. They did that, and then they've given a ruling. I respect the ruling, so be it. Congratulations once again to Edem Agbana. And I want to hope and believe that, look, as a young man, he would learn his rope, he would learn his lesson, and then he will grow up in the parliamentary, you know, practice. I know, I taught him, he's a very astute, dynamic, um, um, young man who is also receptive to learning. And so I believe you quickly um, learn and then the people there would have a good representative. So congratulations to him. I commend the party echelons for once again showing boldness, confidence and resilience and also robustness in everything that they have done. And I, I am excited about them. If you look at the events that happened throughout the elections, when people were confused and people didn't know whether the elections were going to come off and, and all that, they were able to boldly tell and insist that regardless of whatever is going on at the court, their elections were going to take place. And they insisted on that, put in place, look at the last minute arrangement that they had to marshal and put in place to get the elections, you know, to take place. It's something that is commendable. And then when this issue came, um, they've been able to boldly also give a ruling. This is a party executive that others must look up to and emulate. Not a party executive that, are made, that is made up of people you can simply describe as immature and people who are not bold and confident and they don't have the courage to be able to correct things that are wrong. They don't have the courage to be able to, to rein people in when they run afoul of their own rules. They don't have the courage and conviction to um, put their foot down to ensure that things are done right. I mean, they should be emulating um, these kinds of um, leadership attributes that have been exhibited by Chairman Asiedun Ketia and then the General Secretary and other top party echelons. I think it's good for uh, um, um, Ghana's democracy. A political party that is seeking election, a political party that is in power. These parties must be headed and by, they must be led by people who are courageous, people who are bold, people who are resilient, people who are able to inspire confidence and to give hope to their support base. A very, very important point there. And, for example, maybe in a minute before we go, uh, apart from the, the outcome of this and the appeal made to uh, the, the losing candidate, in this case, John Ad Adanu, what else would you expect, both 
that's the party executives to do to ensure especially that element of unity going into the 2024 elections because of that overall objective of winning the elections in 2024 well they should close their ranks the ruling has been given already um whether you like it or not edward Agbana has been declared victorious and so it is in their own interest it's, it's a safety for the ndc but um it's in their own interest to close their ranks how the losing candidate works closely with the NDC will determine what happens to his own political future and his own political career. If you remain antagonistic and you try to do this to undermine a young man, people will see it. And at the end of the day, it is you who will lose because the party echelons will see that you are not trying to be cooperative. Political parties, uh, every political party, one feature that you can see in them is that there's always guaranteed disagreement and guaranteed conflict but when they occur and they are resolved we all must move on and so they must move on close their ranks and see how they can campaign together um to, to win the seat there Professor Jampo, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Appreciate it. Professor Ransford Jampo is a professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Lagon. This is Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Let's say a bit further with the outcomes of the NDC's presidential parliamentary primaries. The Sunyang West constituency chairman of the NDC, Augustine Kwame Boating, has said a decision by the court would bring finality to the dispute regarding the constituency's parliamentary primary. Now, in an interview... Uh, following a successful presidential primary held on Saturday, Mr. Boateng said the parties involved would appear in court m on May 23. That's next week, Tuesday. He said this was going to bring finality to the issues in the constituency because once the matter was before the courts, whatever the courts will say will be the final judgment. So that constituency is one of 16 constituencies that the parliamentary primaries did not take place in. It will be recalled that one of the aspirants, Mrs. Evelyn Akantua, sought a court injunction to be placed on the Shinyai West NDC parliamentary primaries after she was disqualified by the functional executive committee of the, of the party. According to petitions against her candidature, she had not spent more than four years in the party while some present that particular issue that indeed past constituency executives as well as branch executives also denied knowing her. In fact, as a result, Mrs. Akantua, however, believes she had not been treated fairly by the Functional Executive Committee of the NDC and therefore sought to seek justice before a competent court of jurisdiction, hence the injunction to enable her to contest in the constituency's parliamentary primaries. The other two aspirants in that constituency were Ernest Ayesu Sr. and one Melissa Tiaboa Amankwa, but the former was also disqualified by the Functional Executive Committee and the latter therefore became the only aspirant in, in the contest. So that's what's happening in that particular constituency. We're keeping a close eye on the Sunyani West constituency uh, and the primaries that did not take place, the parliamentary primaries that did not take place for, for the NDC there. There's going to be a court ruling next week, Tuesday, the 23rd of May. We'll see how the way forward will look like. But this is Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. We're also live on Kesme 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. We're live all across the world on 3news.com. You can also watch us now on Facebook Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're streaming live at 3FM 927. It's at 3FM 927. We'll definitely will get your thoughts and your comments read to the rest of the world. It's time for the latest in the world of business. Nanikia Mensa Brampa is here. And we're, 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 uh, we're counting down to the uh, the IMF first tranche of $600 million coming in, all things being a call by the end of the week, according to the finance ministry. But apart from that, I've been looking at the fewer prizes. Okay. It went down by just, what, 34 pesos? Is 50, that the 50, they, they said it was 50 pesos. No. I mean, well, uh, that's what the projections least. were saying. The IES, as well as Copec predicted mm -hmm. 50 pesos. But I've, I've seen, seen 34 30, pesos. Yeah, 34, 35. Oh, can't we do it with Some 50. Star Oil is selling at 11. Uh, wait, let me, let me, let me not give you 50 no, quotes. Well, let well, me just but get I mean, it right. Alfred. I mean, Goyle is doing so something Star in the region Oil of... is 11 cities. I was getting it right. 59 pesos. So they did the 50 peso reduction. But if you see Goyle... Well, they've always been below. But Goyle I mean, is at 12 cities, 30 pesos for petrol and diesel. So 
your your no, consumption I mean, I, I think and I'm your beginning to understand why the likes purchasing of the, power will determine which are you buy. Dan Kanamua would make the point that there's a feeling that some of these OMCs are shortchanging the consumers. When it comes to the margin of reduction, there's always some reason that they want to recover losses, so they don't give the full margin of reduction. Right. But when it comes to increase, they increase full margin. And, and, and it's exactly the, the point he made on Monday that we should expect 50 peso reduction. That is what is supposed to be. But if you don't have that experience from your local pumps, it means that they are trying to make up for the losses in the past but i haven't seen much losses because we've seen uh, increases throughout i think this is just the second uh, yeah. a, a reduction in in this particular pricing anyway, window but we all go with public transport it's going down by 10 percent yes. good stuff i don't know the 10 out of the meeting we're still waiting to hear what they would they would say with mm. regards to the meeting if they will stick to the 10 percent like fuel was supposed to go down 50 percent you calculate are looking, i don't know different different because from stations. adenta to cycle is six cities 50 pesos so 10 percent no i mean i'm telling you because yeah, i know me. you you don't you don't patronize trotro i don't oh, but I buy anyway, well. it's all right but let's go so once we talk that. about that inflation uh, has already come out and the monetary policy committee of the bank of ghana will also begin their meetings uh tomorrow which is wednesday to determine the policy rate which is currently at 29.5 percent so a lot of predictions have started coming out or projections if i should say from the various analysts economist dr edu Ususakodia says that he's expecting to see at least a 120 basis point increase in the policy rate ahead of the upcoming monetary policy committee meeting and speaking to three business the economist stated uh, he had a projection or he had projected a 32% policy rate increment by the end of the year. Uh, I mentioned that last at the last meeting it was 29.5%. But let's hear the expectations from Dr. Idu Susakodia. If you are fighting inflation with a tool, which is the MPC rate, uh, the policy rate, and you are getting the results, will you continue? Yeah, I think they should continue. Inflation is having a downward trend. In fact, the whole of this year, we expected the MPC rate, uh, policy rate to be going up, the whole of this year, to be hitting around 32%. Uh, and so the likelihood that they will increase the policy rate is very high. Um, uh, they may increase the policy rate again or at best maintain it. Around 120, 100 is fine. But that's what beats my mind, Alfred, when I hear some of these analysts. And he's not the first analyst I have spoken to or economist I have spoken to today talking about an expected increase. He is looking at 32% by the end of the year. But I remember just last week, Madame Elsie Awaji, uh, the deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, also asking commercial banks to work on their rates when it comes to Absolutely. loans. So I don't know the balance, but we'll see what comes out of the uh, MPC meeting this week before Monday we get to know the policy mm. rate. And meanwhile, Dr. Edu Ususakodia wants government to also, as a matter of agency, provide some liquidity supports to local banks that may be struggling as a result of the domestic debt exchange program. Mm. I foresaw it because the, the bank's diversification of their investment is so limited. You know, most of them can count like 40%, 50%, 60% of their investment in government bonds. Why? Because we have been told in the lecture room that the government bond is the safest. And so they decided to invest their funds there instead of taking it to other areas like building real estates. University of Ghana now needs hostels, so uh, they should be building hostels for the universities, something like that. That's so they should diversify, and they haven't diversified. So once you put all your eggs in one basket and it cracks, something happens to the basket or the eggs crack. And that's what is happening, and it's unfortunate. I think going forward, I want to advise the, the banks to diversify, and also individuals like you and me. We don't always have to buy treasury bills, but I think the government should you know, help them now. They have the financial stability fund, isn't it? Uh, I think they expect some over $350 million to be hit into their account. I think that they should use that to show up the banks, especially those that are really, you know, having the, uh, the big hit. Uh, they should help them uh, revive their company. Economists 
Dr. Edu Oususa Kodye there. And talking about reactions after that $600 million IMF deal, which is expected this week, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, Mark Bedua Baji, paid a kettle call to Media General. And to that effect, he was also having some conversations with us behind the scenes. He has been reacting to the announcement by government that Ghana will receive the first tranche of the $3 billion IMF package this week. With the money coming in, we are likely to see inflation coming down, even though we've seen some positive signs. We are also hoping that there will be some stability in the foreign exchange market. We hope also that the central bank will follow suit, looking at the trend of reduction in inflation and also stability in the exchange rate to reduce the policy rates. Because any time the policy rate goes up, when it's high, interest rate also uh, goes up. It means that cost of borrowing is high. And for a country like ours, where businesses always get their sources of funding from the bank, any time the interest rate is high, it affects business performance. The reduction in prices may not be immediate. Because all the things that I've mentioned, inflation and other things, stability, will not be an overnight thing. It will take some time. But when we see the positive signs of inflation coming down, of uh, the CD putting up a strong performance, and also interest rates coming down, of course, it will translate into lower cost of production or doing business. That is where possibly the prices of goods and services will come down because every business will calculate the price based on the cost and the margin. So when the prices, the cost is coming down, the likelihood that the prices will also come down is also there. And that was the Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of Commerce, Mark Bedou Abwache, there. In a move to enhance aviation services in Ghana, the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority is preparing to commence the construction of a state-of-the-art air traffic control tower. The Director General of the Authority, Engineer Charles Ebukakwe, highlighted that this project is a crucial step in maintaining Ghana's position as a benchmark for aviation excellence in the sub-region. We have also modernized our infrastructure, constructing a new air navigation service complex that will commence operations very soon. The world-class center, the second largest in Africa, after a similar facility in South Africa, will deliver air traffic management services, communication, navigation, and surveillance systems, meteorological services for air navigation, and aeronautical information management, among others. Ahead of this, we had installed a new ATM system and upgraded older equipment around the country, including those located in Sao Tome and Principe. Let me add that plans are far advanced for the authority to begin construction of another ultra-modern air traffic control tower building, as the current one in use has lived its purpose, even though the equipment being used can match any modern ATC tower worldwide. And that was the Director General of the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority, Engineer Charles Ibo Krakwe, speaking at the 37th anniversary of the authority. Just before we go, the Council of the European Union has given its final approval for its deforestation regulation aimed at reducing deforestation associated with key EU market imports. The regulation is targeted at cocoa, palm oil, cattle, wood, coffee, rubber, and soya. Any of these commodities not produced according to the new law will face an EU market restriction or ban. The rules also apply to a number of derived products such as chocolate, furniture, printed paper, and selected palm oil-based derivatives. So you can log on to 3news.com. You get more updates on this as well as some other business stories. My name is Nana Ikia Mensa Abrampa. Uh, that's it for business. Sports is next. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nani Kia. And uh, on the sports on Hot Edition, now uh, we'll be looking at the latest stories and also previewing UEFA Champions League action to happen today and on Wednesday. But before we do that, let's look uh, at Ghana football because earlier today, the Ghana Football Association uh, launched the GFA school, which is for youngsters, and they are seeking to partner uh, tertiary schools, including UPSC, Gimpa, Legon, and KNUSD, amongst others. Uh, let's now hear from the Ghana Football Association President, Keto Kriku, and then the technical director of the association, Bernard Lippe. And the Ghana Football School, working with your good selves, will and must close this knowledge gap and ensure that we give our sports 
the future it so deserves today. Our football deserves a good future, and that future can only be offered if you decide to partner with the Football Association on this journey. The journey to invest in our youth, the journey to invest in our middle age, the journey to invest even in our old age. Why not, if you want to develop a association, a football club, you need this development on a high level, this knowledge in all areas of a club. What means administration, merchandising, marketing, and I think this will change our country because the most successful countries in football are the most the countries with the most knowledge. Well, that was Bernard Lefe speaking there. Elia was Ket Okreku. But let's do some more here. UEFA Champions League action where on Wednesday, a blockbuster match between Real Madrid and Man City is expected as the first leg ended in a one all draw. Only one team out of the two can make it to the final in Istanbul later this year. And Carlo Ancelotti says that he's been losing sleep over tactics to use against Pep Guardiola at the Etihad. The idea last year as Valverde as a fullback that helped us win the league and the Champions League. Uh, and the three forwards up front allowed us to get to the semi final, uh, winning pretty much all our games. So it's a decision that uh, it's not an easy it's it's not an easy decision to make, but I have already made it. Well, Ancelotti says that he's already made decisions in terms of his, his tactics uh, to play against Pep Guardiola uh, on Wednesday. Uh, but Guardiola himself has admitted that to be able to qualify past uh, Real Madrid, they have to do it the hard way and play better than the 14-time UEFA Champions League winners. Yeah, we arrived, we arrived really, really good for the fact that uh, we are in the FA Cup final. We are one game away to win the Premier League in semi-final championship. But at the same time, we have to play much better than Madrid game. So then you can arrive in a good moment. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, it's proof to be here, but we have to perform well. It's not just with the desire, the dream. <coughs> you know, it's, it's just I tell him, so relax. So all you have to do is what you have done. Many years, I would say, or especially this season. So this is what we have to do. So not just for the desire to reach the final or do, we are going to do it. I had the feeling we had to do better than, than, than Bernabeu to, to reach the final. Well, that was Pep Guardiola speaking ahead of the Real Madrid Man City game. That's on Wednesday evening. But before that, there would be one team tonight making it to the final between Inter Milan and AC Milan. First leg and a 2 0 in favor of uh, AC Milan is still at the San Siro. But this time around, Inter are the home team. The lineups are, are out for both teams. Onana starting goals, Damiana Chebi, Bastoni in the back three. It's the midfield five that started in the first leg. Dumfries, Barella, Chaganoglu, Mikitarian, Di Marco. And up front, is the same pair that caused all sorts of troubles. That's Lotaro Martinez and Edin Dzeko. The big news for AC Milan is that Portuguese winger Rafael Leal returns after he missed the first leg due to injury and he joins uh, Brahim Diaz, Messias and Giroud up front. In midfield is Tonali and Kunic and the defensive back four is Calabria, uh, Thiago comes in, Tomori. Dio Hernandez and then Magnan keeps his place in goal. Kickoff is at 7 p.m. We'll bring you updates on that on our social media at 3 Sports GH. My name is Ray Kwampo and that's how we wrap up the sports segment here. Yeah, up next on Hot Edition is Entertainment with a Koffer. Thank you very much, Shereku, for that one. And coming up on entertainment tonight, Ghanaian artist Mr. Drew has confirmed that he has parted ways with record label Highly Spiritual after his contract officially ended. Speaking on TV3 New Day, he revealed why he decided not to renew his contract with his former boss, Kewa, suggesting that there was no bad blood but only wanted to move ahead with his career. The second hit maker is currently on a media tour to promote his new single tomorrow. I've not left Highly Spiritual. My contract with Highly Spiritual has ended. What does that mean? Explain it. My, because, I, I signed a contract. But you're not there anymore. You don't do music under their auspices no, when you say anymore. I, I left Highly Spiritual. Somebody might take it in a different uh, But every contract so, is renewable, Mr. Dean. So, so my contract ended with... My contract with Highly Spiritual ended. That was it. Um, but was, it, was there not... A catch that says that it's renewable? Um, there is, but for that, it's, it's an option, right? It's optional. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a, an obligatory thing that mm. you need to mm. renew. Mm. It's optional. If you want to renew, then that's fine. But 
Yeah, um, for now, right. all I can say is my contract ended with Highly Spiritual, and that's it. Why don't you want to renew it? You think that he can do well enough for you? Um, that that I don't think that's the case. It's What's more, of, case? yeah, it's more of um, moving ahead as as a as a being or as an artist. Mm. And it doesn't have to do with whether they did enough or mm. they didn't mm. do enough. Yeah. Mm. Do, do you have Kwa's blessings? Oh yeah, yeah. To not renew. Yeah, 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 I speak to him almost every time. You're sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not upset with you. Yeah, I was. I was at um, his mom's. The mother's funeral. funeral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were there, so yeah. there's still sonship and father oh, yeah, going on between definitely. you. Definitely, I speak Kewa. to him every time. Okay. Every time. And you heard there, Mr. Drew, earlier on TV3 New Day. Away from that promising Zambian actor, MC, and finalist for the Mading Africa Monologue Challenge, Jeremy Mumba, has arrived in Ghana ahead of the May 27 finale. The thespian has high hopes of beating competition from nine other versatile actors poised to win glory for their countries at the Mading Africa Monologue Challenge. Then get out. Go to a hotel. Go anywhere you want, but don't come back. The Africa Monologue Challenge was launched in April 2022 as part of efforts to promote the art and entertainment sector of the African continent and to provide a platform for emerging talents. The competition received over 400 entries from across the globe, with 50 finalists shortlisted to represent different African countries and Africans in the diaspora. 40 actors were further booted out of the competition after being put through different stages of tests and tasks. Ten top finalists, including six ladies and four gentlemen, will battle it out for the ultimate prize on May 27 at the National Theatre. Versatile Zambian actor and finalist Jeremy Mumba has arrived in Ghana ahead of the final. I have threats. I have people I can say, I'll be like, hmm, this one, yeah, definitely, this one is my competition. But everyone has a competition, but my biggest competitor is myself. Winning this doesn't really mean much, but being among the top 10 means a lot to me. Because... Jeremy is all poised to win the Made in Africa Monologue Challenge and make his country proud. They should expect art from 10 brilliant minds. And finally, before I wrap up, Kojo Akwabwa, veteran high life legend and record producer, also father of high life musician Akwabwa Jr., has passed on. Kojo Akwabwa is known for his song Are Chichwe, which caught the attention of many and got massive airplay in the country. Akwabwa Jr. currently has a remix with his father's hit single titled Are Chichwe, which also comes with a music video featuring his father. Now, some celebrities took their social media, took to their social media to commiserate with Akwabwa, broadcaster and entrepreneur. Beku Santana said, my sincere condolences to you and the family. May the Lord strengthen you in this time of difficulty. Adina Thembi also says, oh no, please accept my condolences at Aquabwa Music. And Amanda GC also came through with hers by saying condolences, Aquabwa. And that's all the entertainment news right here on Hot Edition, powered by 3 Entertainment. My name is Akofa. Thank you very much for listening. And he gave us a lot of good music. Very good um, music. I've good been music, humming really the tune the entire time since I had the news like is it like I'll be quiet in the next minute I am humming the thing it's me his so rest in peace indeed I think it's a good way to to end hot yeah. edition by playing the song with a song yes that song that you like yeah yeah This note, I want to say thank you for staying with us here on Hot Edition. I am Alfred Okansi on behalf of the team. Join us same time tomorrow. Join me at 10 p.m. on TV3 for Ghana Tonight. Have a great evening.